As the daughter of a Swedish nobleman, she could not have anticipated the life she ended up living. A life far from home, far from her family, and quite different from what she had previously known. The Tudor's Dynasty Podcast. Today we explore the life of Helena Snakenborg. Accompanying her Swedish mistress on a journey would alter her life trajectory forever. Little did she anticipate when she embarked on the voyage that it would lead her to England permanently, where she would serve Queen Elizabeth I for the remainder of her days. Additionally, she would marry the brother of Catherine Parr, sealing her fate in the annals of English history. Picture this. Just four years into the reign of Queen Elizabeth, she confronts the ravages of smallpox, hovering precariously on the edge of mortality. Unwed and without heirs, her counsel is seized with anxiety, contemplating the consequences should their queen succumb to illness. The urgency of securing a marriage and ensuring the succession weighs heavily on their minds. Fortunately, Elizabeth defies the odds and survives. Yet the quest to find her consort unfolds with unprecedented haste. It's conceivable that Queen Elizabeth's heart longed solely for her lifelong confidant, Robert Dudley, as her suitor or spouse. However, circumstances such as the mysterious death of Dudley's wife, Amy Robsart, in 1560, among other factors, rendered their union impossible. Faced with this reality, Elizabeth's counsel diligently pursued potential matches for her, including the consideration of Eric the Fourteenth of Sweden. In a letter penned by the Queen in February 1560, she unequivocally conveys her lack of romantic interest in the Swedish monarch with the following words. And while we perceive therefrom that the zeal and love of your mind towards us is not diminished, Yet in part we are grieved that we cannot gratify your Serene Highness with the same kind of affection. And that indeed does not happen because we doubt in any way of your love and honour. But as often we have testified both in words and in writing, that we have never yet conceived a feeling of that kind of affection towards anyone. Finally, Elizabeth concludes her letter by reiterating her long-standing declaration that we do not conceive in our heart to take a husband, but highly commend the single life and hope that your Serene Highness will not longer spend time in waiting for us. Yet Eric remained undeterred, seemingly captivated by the charms of the English Queen. Even following her brush with death in late 1564, his affection for her endured. Intrigued by the incessant praise of her brothers, King Eric and Prince John, extolling Elizabeth's virtues and the splendor of her court, Princess Cecilia became eager to witness the source of such fervor firsthand. Before setting sail for England, Cecilia undertook the task of learning English and initiated a correspondence with Elizabeth through letters. This correspondence ultimately culminated in the decision of the Swedish princess to voyage to England. Driven by her desire to experience firsthand the wonders that had been relayed to her by others, and to also, as rumor had it, press the suit of her brother, King Eric, to wed Queen Elizabeth. Shortly after the arrival of the heavily pregnant princess and her husband in England, she gave birth to a son. This baby boy, christened Edward, garnered such adoration that Queen Elizabeth herself was chosen as his godmother and even carried him at the christening ceremony. As a princess of Sweden, Cecilia was attended by her own retinue of ladies during her journey. However, one among them captured the attention of the English queen more than the rest, Helena Snagenborg. Helena was the strikingly beautiful daughter of a Swedish nobleman. Helena's beauty not only captivated Elizabeth, but also attracted the attention of the much, much older William Parr, Marquess of Northampton. You know his name because he was the brother of Henry VIII's last wife, Catherine Parr, 
which means he was also brother-in-law to Thomas Seymour. You know I can't resist bringing him into a story when it works. The nature of their relationship remains a mystery, as it's unclear whether it was a love match. William Parr was already in an unhappy marriage when he encountered Helena. It wasn't until January 1571, following the death of his wife, that he became free to marry Helena. The couple were married that May. Sadly, the aged William Parr died six months after their wedding day. Following William's death and her mourning period, Helena continued her service at court, maintaining a position as a close confidant and gentlewoman of the privy chamber to Queen Elizabeth. Thus, it comes as little surprise that when Helena clandestinely married Thomas Georges, a groom of the privy chamber a few years later, that she incurred the wrath of the queen. At the court of Queen Elizabeth, a lot of her ladies incurred her wrath by secretly marrying. Look no further than Latisse Knowles, Bess Throckmorton, and Catherine Gray. Much like the others, Helena was banished from court for a brief period, and her husband, Thomas, was imprisoned in the Tower of London. But it wasn't for long. Helena had made some powerful connections at court in her decade in England, and between that and the Queen's love for her, she was able to regain favor for both herself and her husband. So much so that when their first child was born in 1578, Queen Elizabeth was named Godmother, and the child was named for her. Helena Snakenborg is often depicted as a gentle and amiable figure who skillfully steered clear of the many court intrigues. Her steadfast dedication to her family, spanning both England and Sweden, was widely recognized. Despite never returning to her native land and missing the opportunity to reunite with her Swedish relatives, she remained committed to them through consistent correspondence. Notably, her husband, Thomas, seized the chance to travel to Sweden as part of an English embassy in 1582, granting him the privilege of meeting some of Helena's kin. In 1584, Helena and her husband were granted the estate of Sheen by Elizabeth I a former monastic property. This property was close to Richmond Palace, Elizabeth's primary residence, and gave them a place close to court to live with their children and still serve out their royal duties. This also allowed Helena to be near the queen as her health began to deteriorate. Following Queen Elizabeth's passing in 1603, Helena took on the solemn role of chief mourner at her funeral. Several months later, during the coronation of Elizabeth's successor, King James, both Helena and Thomas played active roles in the ceremony. The succession of King James brought about some limitation to Helena in her husband's roles at court. Nonetheless, she found an important role as a mediator between King James and her childhood friend, Carl, now King Carl IX of Sweden, with whom she had stayed in touch with during her time abroad. After the passing of her husband, Thomas, in 1610, Helena gradually retreated from court, where she had been a prominent figure for nearly 45 years. In her final years, she resided with her son at Longford Castle. She peacefully passed away at the castle in 1635, having reached the age of 86. Helena was laid to rest beside Thomas Georges in Salisbury Cathedral. Thank you so much for joining me today to learn about this Swedish noble lady who became a member of the English peerage and a confidant of Queen Elizabeth I. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Tudor's Dynasty podcast. You can follow and support the Tudor's Dynasty podcast on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Patreon at Tudor's Dynasty.